I was saved into the Presbyterian Church as an ex-hippie when I was 31. Uh, I got married in the Presbyterian Church. Our kids were baptized in the Presbyterian Church. Um, I didn't know I was Reformed because, you know, lay people don't understand that kind of language, right? It was 25 years later when I was sharing some of the stuff that's in my book and the Anabaptists in the crowd said, your stuff is too Reformed. And I said, what do you mean? And um, so finally that's one of the reasons I had to go to Fuller so that we could explain that stuff to the hopeless agency guy, which is what I am. That's what I'm going to talk about, and I hope you're, you're going to have to be able to see and follow the diagram, so I hope that's going to work for you. Um, what I want to do basically in an hour is just do a very brief introduction to what I would suggest is a biblical view of poverty and development. And um, did that work? Yeah. So I'm going to look a little bit at the nature of poverty and its causes. I'm going to look a little bit at how do you think about poverty holistically. Um, I'm going to talk then, if you have a clear understanding of what poverty is, that tends to shape how you respond. And so we'll look at response um, and uh, try to, to finish up uh, at 10 o'clock. Now I need your help. Now I thought I was going to have a whiteboard here so that you guys could call stuff out and I could write it up. So you're going to have to imagine that there's a whiteboard. But I need you to help me. What are the kinds of words that you have heard people use or you've heard other places about poor people? What kind of language do people use? The poor are what? Uneducated. Lazy. Victims. Hungry. Hopeless. Under-resourced. Taken advantage of what? Trash, okay. All right, and these, what you've just heard are fairly typical. I've been playing this game now for a long time. And that's pretty much what I hear. Hopeless, uh, helpless, lazy, sick, uneducated, marginalized victims. Now, if I announce that that's what I think about poor people in the midst, in a room full of poor people, how do you think they're going to hear that? Okay? Not too good. Okay? And if you don't take anything else away from my talk this morning, that's what I want you to take away. The language that you use, the images that you use to describe the poor predispose you to a particular understanding of poor people. Poor people are not stupid. They will figure out in a minute what that language is that you use. But they can't afford to tell you to go to hell. So they'll sit there and take that language because they need your help. The most important thing you can do if you want to be helpful to poor people is to start dealing with your own stuff. What are the language? Do I really believe that? Because if I'd asked that question, do you really believe poor people are like that, other kinds of language would emerge, right? You have other thoughts. But we've been trained in our culture to slide into them as hopeless, helpless, etc., etc., if this is your view of the poor, that kind of negative language, what does that make you? You're judgmental, you're superior. It's a subtle invitation that I'm here to help you, you poor, helpless person, because I have things you need. Okay, you never, Nobody talks like that, I hope, but that's going on in the back of your mind, and the devil's in your ear. You good person, you, you godly Christian man or woman, okay? Aren't you just wonderful taking care of these poor, helpless, hopeless people? And the invitation to superiority finds expression in your ministry. You act like you're superior. You don't listen. We're a problem-solving culture in America. So we go solve problems. That's what ministry becomes. Some folks have already decided what the poor need before they ever leave their church. <laughs> They've already got the package. And that's okay. Because any one of you could walk into a rural slum, or urban slum, and if I gave you 20 minutes, you could come back with a 3 by 5 card with a list of six things that need to be fixed. 
you'd look at the dirty water in the street, the lack of sanitation, you'd see the poor housing, you see kids without proper clothing and malnourished, and you'd be right. Those six things all need to be fixed. Who did the learning? Who did the assessing? Who did the problem solving? So who got smarter? And who didn't? Who did you just train to be passive? To act as if, well, we can't fix anything. If somebody doesn't come and help us, nothing changes. We train the poor to think poor by the way we do our ministry. Okay, now I'm going to go on to what I came here to say. But this is, I think, the most important thing, is, is to the self-examination of your mission group, of your short-term mission, of yourself. What's the baggage that I bring? How comfortable am I just loving them? That's actually all God told you to do. There's nowhere in Scripture He says, go fix the poor, right? Love your neighbor. That's it. That's what he asked for. Okay, let's see if I can make this puppy work. So now we've done that holistic understanding of poverty. I'm going to very briefly outline. Development, by the way, is a new idea. It, it became an idea and began to get practiced after World War II. It's, it's fairly recent. And it started with, well, what I just described. You can see it. The poor lack stuff. Their housing isn't very good. Their water's not very clean. They don't have potable water. They don't have sanitation. They lack things. And that's true, right? But if that's all you see, that's all you see. And what happened is as folks began to do this kind of work, they began to realize that actually there's some other things that the poor don't have. They don't have basic education. Where did you learn basic common sense health care? Hmm? Yeah, from your family, from your mom. Wash your hands, cover your mouth, don't come to the table until this, da 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 da. Okay? That's how you learned health care. There are a lot of moms in the world that don't know that because their moms didn't know that. Okay? So we began to realize that there's ideas that they don't have, they can't read a seed packet. So then they don't handle the seeds properly. And so this idea of the poor lack knowledge and skills um, in terms of they don't know how to run a business, they don't know basic health and nutrition. But then, whoops, come on, there you go. The other thing was, because the first two, the poor lack things is the give a man a fish. You know that old saw, right? And the second one is, well, teach the man to fish, right? Because that's better, because they can feed himself for a lifetime. What happens if he doesn't have access to a boat or the water? In other words, knows how to fish, but can't fish, isn't allowed to fish. And so all of a sudden we began to realize this has to do with access. Okay? What's the problem with those three frames? Lack. Look at the top. It's poverty is a deficit. Poor people are broken. Poor people don't have whatever. It's seeing them again in that deficit view. It's not as pernicious as helpless, hopeless, lazy, but it's the same basic frame. They're missing stuff, things, ideas, training. So what does that invite you to do? Absolutely. You become the development Santa Claus. You bring what's missing, you bring the knowledge, and basically that's what World Vision did for the first 20 years. It was logistics. How do we get the stuff they need, education, material, that kind of thing, into the game? So you've got two critical questions that you always need to ask as you're looking at anybody's program, which is what's the implied view of poor people? And is it whole? Is it Christian? Because what's a poor person in the eyes of God? Huh? Another soul. Another soul. Be worse than that. His child. Made in the image of God. Just like you. Oh. So when God looks at the poor, 
It's like me looking at you. That's who I'm looking at. People made in the image of God. And then the other is the implied view of development that follows if you haven't decoded this, because you become the provider of things, ideas, and access. That's very attractive, because it means you can pile stuff here and then take it over there and hand it out and go home and you've done a good job, right? Or you can get some people that know how to do community-based healthcare training and you take them into the villages and they do their training and you go home and you've done a good job. This is very practical. It feels like you're doing something. I want to share a framework that's different. And this comes from a guy named Jaya Kumar Christian. Uh, Jaya Kumar and I joined World Vision about the same time in the 70s when World Vision had no idea what it was doing in relief or development. Not a clue. I mean, I'd just been hired. I'd been a Christian for six months. I have a PhD in biochemistry, and I'm an ex-hippie. So what do I have to offer to World Vision or the poor? All right? The, fortunately, I didn't ask those questions at that time because I probably would have just turned around and walked back out the door. But what, what Jaya Kumar, who spent, and he's now the National Director of India, World Vision of India has got 300,000 sponsored children. It's a huge organization. But he spent most of it in the villages. And what he said was, first of all, there's not a poor person, there's always a poor household. There's always a poor household. And he said, basically, that household is embedded in five systems which disempower the poor. So he's thinking about poverty as basically being disempowered by your context. So he is not blaming the poor for their poverty, he's looking at their context. And he said basically systems interact. And that's what traps the poor and disempowers the poor and basically beats them down. The biophysical system is just that. It's your body and your mind. This is where most development work is focused. Better nutrition, clean water, uh, better agriculture, better housing, etc., etc., to strengthen it. We now know that if a child is malnourished in the first 20 months, months of life, they are permanently learning disabled. Diminished, at least, not disabled. But basically, there are limitations for the rest of their life in terms of what their brains can do. Okay? When you're poor, you are subject to lots of disease. That makes you weak. That makes you weak and not strong. Um, when you're doing back-breaking labor, or you're in a factory in which there are no protections, uh, you basically, again, uh, have this sense of weakness, etc. So that's where, that's kind of the thing everybody knows, and that's kind of the thing where most development work focuses. Jaya went farther than just that. And he said, basically, all cultures have things in them that are against life, that diminish life. It's just in the same way that all cultures have things in it that enhance life, that create joy and flourishing. So this guy's from India. What would be an example of a flaw in Indian culture which helps keep people poor? The caste system, okay? You're a Dalit, that's the end of the story. You're born into a caste, that's where you're gonna die, okay? He also talked about karma, all right? The perfect system of justice. If you mess up, you get punished. If you don't mess up, you don't get punished, okay? So when you sit down with Indian villagers who really believe in karma and say, you know what, this poverty doesn't have to be. We could clean up the water. We could send your kids to school. We could improve the condition of the village. What are they hearing? Yeah, and what happens when you fight your karma? Yeah, you come back as an insect. In other words, it's an invitation to sin. So you really have to understand the culture that you're working in. And you've got to make sure that the so-called good news that you're bringing is actually being heard as good news. That's what he calls inadequacies in worldview. What's an inadequacy in, in an American worldview? Yeah. 
All right? Consumerism. Shop till you drop. That's your better human future. Okay, we got all, and in other words, all cultures have flaws. All cultures have things that basically say that has to be examined. He then talks about the social system. This is the politics, the economics, the religious system, if it's part of the power structure. And he says, basically, those folks, the poor, live captive to the God complexes of the non-poor. Now, he's thinking of a landlord in rural village India. The landlord decides whether you get a plot of land this year or not. The landlord decides whether or not you can get married. The landlord decides who you can marry. The landlord decides what they'll name your children. That's kind of a really godlike position, right? But if you think you know what the poor need and they're just going out pitching your answer, what are you doing? It's another form of being godlike. I know better than you, okay? The inadequacies of worldview and the guys with the God complexes work really together because there's always a narrative as to why I am in charge. I have the right education, I was born in the right family, the right part of the country, I'm the right tribe, I'm the right whatever, and this is why I'm in charge, and so, so should it be. And the poor consequently get also trained to believe that you are supposed to be in charge and that they're not. We're not, we're not very smart. We're not very competent. We don't have anything. We don't know how to do anything. And so you get a reinforcing connections between these things. Then he adds the piece that is missing in all secular theory on development, which is the spiritual system. And this is not just about lost souls. This is about principalities and powers. This is about the fallen social and economic structures. When I try to convince you that I am supposed to be in charge, that it is ordained and it's what God wants, that's a lie. Right? When I tell you you're hopeless and useless and you really need to just sit down, shut up, and do what you're told, because that's all you're worth, that's a lie. Where do the lies come from? Where do the greedy people come from? Where do the people that oppress come from? Why is it that ministries of justice don't do any ministry and almost never do justice? Why do governments mess up, even with the highest of noble intentions, right across the top of the door, declares their good intention? It doesn't happen. I remember going into the World Bank, this is about, I don't know, 20 years ago, and we were building a major international advocacy function in World Vision, and the bank was obviously pretty important in our universe. And I had this kind of mental model. So I went into the bank, and I'm meeting everybody and networking and doing all the things you're supposed to do, but I'm looking for the evil bastards that are screwing the poor. You know, which one of these people or which part of the bank is sitting behind closed doors saying, you know what, if we did this, we can get more money. Okay, we can take it. I couldn't find an evil bastards. Not one. They were all just like you and me. Well educated, great hearts, wanting to do good. Not one evil bastard. But it did a lot of evil. This is what this gets. For those of you uh, who have read Walter Wink, this is what he's focused on. Is that the social structures, the institutions also fell. It's not just fallen individuals. It's fallen social and cultural systems that basically do not take care of people and are not for life. And then he closes his frame with what he calls a personal system. I would call it the psychological system. It's the interiority of people, what's going on in their heart and their mind. Most poverty is seen as kind of the, the stuff on the external. Water's dirty, education isn't good, their clothes aren't adequate, blah, blah. It's all out here. But what he kept discovering in India was a very strong sense of fatalism, of people not wanting or believing that they even should try, of not believing that if they tried it would do any good. 
they had a whole narrative of victim that was locking them down. And that's what he called marred identity. They've come to believe that they're less than human, that God doesn't care. Okay? And this interior piece was the piece that puzzled him the most because none, and basically as I worked with him, we really had no idea what you did about that. How do you take a person who is so damaged psychologically that they won't even try and change that? I mean, I got no tools in my development toolkit that, that work on that kind of thing. Is this making sense? When the non-poor, the, the people that are exercising their God complexes, talk to the poor, they treat them as if they're damaged goods. They talk down to them, or they dismiss them, or they don't bother to listen to them at all. That's why I started with the language that we use to talk about poor people. Because that's the language of the non-poor, describing people they really don't know. There's a guy named uh, Hunter who is at the top of the off-ramp where I get off the freeway to go to school. He's an African-American guy, he's an addict, he's a homeless guy. And then we have these conversations that last anywhere between 5 to 25 seconds depending upon how long the light takes. But I know his name. And I've heard bits and pieces of his story. And what he said is nobody else has ever stopped to ask. They give me money, you know, they try to help. Somebody will hand me some clothes, somebody will give me a bag full of food. Nobody ever asks me my name. Now, I'm not holding myself as some kind of virtuous guy, okay? I'm a big league sinner. Getting to know real poor people, hearing their story, will help you overcome this kind of stuff. But all of those pieces, the cultural views, being weak, um, having a body where your mind isn't sharp, where you're tired all the time, you're sick all the time, there's a heavy amount of deception in the system that's constantly reinforcing the message. Eventually, over time, this gets internalized. It gets internalized. I have been fascinated all my life by the uh, original inhabitants of Africa. They're called the San. Um, some of you may have heard them referred to as the Bushmen. And The Gods Must Be Crazy was a movie 25 years ago that kind of played on the difference between the San and kind of everybody else in Southern Africa at that time. And I've read the anthropology. I've read guys that have this kind of romantic view of this is the way it was in the beginning, hunter-gatherer, you know, kind of thing. And uh, so I was visiting, I was living in Africa, and went down to South Africa to do a review of our work in our South Africa office, and it spread all over the place. And so basically our only way to get around was in a small plane. So a missionary uh, aviation fellowship plane was taking us around. And um, the second evening, we end up flying right into the middle of the Kalahari Desert and land in a little town that's got, I don't know, maybe... 900 people called Gloom. And it's just in the bush. And there was a German missionary lady. She was 67 years old. She'd been out there since she came out at 18 and been witnessing to the, the son. And not one conversion in all those years. So the plan was, it was evening, it was that we'd have dinner at her simple little house and then we would go out in the bush and we would meet a San extended family because that's basically it. This, they don't, they're not organized socially in anything above the extended family. And in the San culture, <clears throat> at the fire in the evening, everybody has a place and a voice. So the kids are there, the women are there, and there's a big fire and all these people are sitting around it like this doing whatever it is that they do when they have a fire at night. So that's where we are. So I'm sitting out in the middle of the, the Kalahari Desert, stunning sky, Southern Cross. I mean, you know how clear it gets in the desert when you can see the stars. 
big fire, and the German lady is sharing the gospel in German. A Swana guy is translating it from German into Swana, and then a third guy is translating it from Swana into San. So we got three tier translation. You can imagine how accurate that is. I, of course, speak none of those languages, so I have no idea what's going on. So I'm just sitting there, just kind of watching and seeing the skies. The San have three clicks in their language, Hong is just one of them. So listening to them talk is a little bit like listening to music. And that's what I did. And we were there, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, and this young woman who was sitting on my right all of a sudden starts waving her finger in the face of the missionary across the fire, and this torrent of clicks. I mean, this lady was agitated. So I have no idea, of course, what's happened. So when we get back to the house about 11.30, I take the missionary lady and say, what was that? And she got so sad. She said, Brian, I've been sharing the gospel out here since I was 18. Nobody's ever said yes. And too often, what I hear is what I heard from the young woman tonight. The young woman said, she said, I had just gotten to the part of the gospel story where I told her that God allowed his son Jesus to die for you. And that's when she exploded. What she said was, I can imagine that God would let his son die for a white man. I might be able to imagine that God would let himself die for a black African. But he would never let his son die for one of us. The San have been hunted like animals. As a matter of fact, the white South Africans actually hunted them for sport when they got bored with lions. The black Africans marauded, killed the men, took the women, made them concubines, and made them take care of their kids. That's all they've ever known is oppression and somebody grinding their face in the dirt. That's all they've ever known for 400, 500, 600 years. I can't imagine that God would let his son die for one of us. Do you hear how all of that has been taken on inside of their group identity, not just personal identity, and they can't believe there's any news for them? That's marred identity. That's when you don't know that you're anybody. That's when you don't know that God knows your name. You can change the clothes of the poor. You can dig wells, you can improve the agricultural production, you can fix the schools, you can improve the housing, but if you don't change that, nothing changes. They'll let you do things to them because that's normal. That's what other people do. They do things to us. You're doing a nice thing, thank you for that. You're not doing a bad thing, but you're doing it to us. When we do to the poor, when we solve their problems, when we act like they don't get it and we do, we're reinforcing that poverty. With our big hearts and our compassion and our sense of the gospel, we're still acting like more like God and treating them more like passive people that can't help themselves. We have a name for that when we have this smart identity problem in our kids in the West. What's it called? Self-esteem. I mean, we're, we go crazy about that stuff, right? You know, can't criticize, don't yell, no names. I mean, we almost make it so safe that it's a different kind of a problem. But it's because we figured out that this is really important stuff, what's going on inside. And it shapes people's view of their life and what they can and cannot do. And these are mostly middle class kids. Hmm. What about poor kids who are hearing from everybody in the family and are everything else around the family that we're nobody? See where I'm going? This is why the gospel commandment to you is not to go and fix the poor. 
not to go and be a successful development whatever. Nowhere in the gospel does it say be successful. It says be faithful. And we got two things we're supposed to do. What are they? Love God and love neighbor. Not love God and fix neighbor. Not love God and save neighbor. Not love God and do something to your neighbor. It's love your neighbor. Because how do you find out who you really are? It's through your relationships. And while we overprotect our kids, and that can get weird, it's motivated fundamentally out of love. I don't want them damaged like I was growing up in a household with an alcoholic father or mother. Okay? It's out of love that we're motivated. And the question is now, and this is the critical question, it's the discerning question, this is a spiritual discernment issue, is what is the best way to love my neighbor so that my neighbor figures out who they really are and why they're here? Is that okay? Okay, how am I doing here? Ah, we're muddling along. Okay. What Jaya did was he basically argued that as he listened to these people explain the reasons why they couldn't participate in the program, they, they couldn't do anything, he discovered that they're bound up in a whole bunch of lies. Remember the spiritual system, the deception? Now this is a compound of five or six different stories, okay? Because the lies change. See, the devil doesn't have to tell the truth. So if he's got a lie that works for you, you can handle your alcohol. You're a real man. As long as you keep believing that and you can't control your drink, the lie's working. The minute you go to AA and you basically decide, no, I can't handle my drink, he just moves on to the next lie. <coughs> God's stuck with the truth. He's got to say the same thing over and over and over again. And so this is an example and he said, basically, if we look at the marred identity of the poor through the social, political, economic, and religious system, the lies that they're telling themselves, that they come to believe, is we're not worthy of exclusion. Dalit in India, the untouchable, they don't even have a caste. And until the liberation theology stuff hit, largely through churches like the Presbyterian Church, they really took it for granted they weren't worthy of having a caste. We have nothing to say because we're stupid people. We don't know anything. We have nothing to contribute economically. We don't have any assets. We don't have any money. God's not interested in us is the religious lie. The guys that have the money and the power are saying you're outside the social system. That's the way it's supposed to be, because the social system is the thing we're supposed to be running. Your purpose is to serve us. Yes, it's true you don't have any assets, but you shouldn't have any because you don't know what to do with them. If we gave you money, you'd drink it. So, for your own good, right? And we'll speak to God on your behalf. A lot of religious systems are predicated on the notion that somebody stands between you and God. That's why in the Presbyterian Church, we moved everything to the side so that you can sit here and look up in the sanctuary directly to the cross. There isn't an intermediary. Inadequacies in worldview. Our place in the social order is fixed. They're supposed to rule over us. Who else would rule? Certainly not my drunken neighbor. Certainly not my hopeless guy here who can't even feed his family. Our poverty is ordained and we've sinned. How do you discover the lies that people believe about themselves? You got to listen. You got to talk. But you can't just go up and say, could you tell me about the lies you believe that really aren't true? <laughs> right? Yeah, that doesn't work, right? What do you have to have before that kind of stuff slowly starts to come out? You got to have a relationship. Whoa. That creates serious issues for short-term missions, doesn't it? 
Because you can't build a relationship in two weeks. Now, I'm not against short-term missions. I'm really not. I just want us to get clear on what they're really for. Uh, and I, be, I want them to be aware of the weaknesses so they can do whatever they can to mitigate them to the extent possible. Okay. The other thing is that in addition to trying to understand how they're trapping themselves through the stories they've been told through their culture, through the stories they've been told by the rich and powerful, the other question is what is the web of truth that needs to replace the web of lies? This is where you really need to know your Bible. You really need to know your Bible. Because basically... The answer for village A is not going to sound the same as the answer for urban slum B. Because the lies are different. This is what... I'm, I'm going to scare you guys out of doing any ministry. You understand that? Okay? Because you're going to have to learn to do theology on the run. You're going to have to learn how to do theology on the run. That means you really do need to know your Bibles. And you need to have kind of a basic theological foundation. Because the, what you're really trying to do when you're helping the poor is to act theologically. It's to act theologically. That your actions are informed by the kinds of material I'm sharing with you so that you avoid some pitfalls and you pray really hard about some of the others for this particular people in this particular place at this particular point in time. You gotta know the gospel. Oh, by the way, you better know Jesus. You can't share somebody you don't know, right? And that means that your spirituality, your devotional life, okay, your, your spiritual formation is just as important as your passion for doing good in the world. You gotta know this Jesus. The other thing which I'm not going to spend any particular time on is that this notion of poverty is in disempowerment, according to Jayakumar Christian, doesn't just work at that local level. When the World Bank and the IMF imposed something called structural adjustment, the Washington Consensus on poor countries in the late 90s, it damaged them hugely when it was supposed to help them economically. Now, everybody makes mistakes, thinks that my prescription over here is going to work for you over there, and that doesn't work out a lot of the time. The problem was the pride, the playing God. Our solution is what you need. You can't get a loan from the World Bank unless you do what we tell you to do. That's playing God at the global level. When the U.S. military went into Iraq to get rid of Saddam Hussein, that was one thing. But to bring democracy to Iraq, that's another thing. Who asked? Who invited? Okay? And what happens, we're seeing the aftermath, which is just didn't take root the way everybody hoped. And the reason was because they weren't ready. Think Arab Spring. Okay? There's kairos. There's moments when things can happen, and then there's moments when... They don't. And again, you have to remember that at the cosmic level, Satan wants this to fail. He does not want people loving God and loving neighbor. And he will tell you whatever lie will work to get you distracted. And the cleverest one is to try to get you to love your neighbor in a way that damages your neighbor. That is really art. In deception. Go in there. You know what they need. Give them what they need. You're a good person, a godly person. You're committed to Christian mission. Go in there and help them now without any reference to a relationships, knowing who they are, knowing what their aspirations might be, what's on the order of priority list. When I lived in Africa, we had a, I don't know what we were doing with a project in the back and beyond of Uganda, 
but it was there, so I had to go out and visit it periodically. So the first time I visited, we sat under the tree with the guys, and we, you know, have all this conversation about what are their needs and what do they think is important, blah, 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 blah. And then I basically said, well, it seems to me then we should start with the schools and the water. And they said, no, we need a band. <laughs> a what? Band. We need a trombone, a drum, and a trumpet in a band and a uniform. Now the sun's going down. I have to leave, okay? So I said, we're taking a time out. I don't understand that, but I'd like to ask more questions, so I'm going to be back here in a bit, and we'll figure this out. I almost dismissed it because it was so stupid. I said, no, we don't need a band. We need water. I don't know what it is, the Holy Spirit thing, because Myers had no idea what he was doing then. Some people are not sure I know what I'm doing now. Um, <laughs> So I went back and I asked questions about the band. Well, it turned out that there was a, another set of villages in the next valley, same tribe. This group that I was working with, the villages were fighting and arguing over everything. But they said, those guys over there, they were arguing too. But three of their kids had been sent to somewhere to go to school. And when they came back, they came back with a drum, a trombone, and a trumpet, and a band. And they stopped fighting because they were so proud of this band. And this became their shared band. So we need one of those. Because we ought to stop fighting before we can work on our water and our education. Oh. So there's a line in the budget in a World Vision program or budget form called Project Supplies. OK? And I got a trombone, a trumpet, and a drum. And nobody in the international office ever knew it. Okay, But that's because I asked some more questions, and I got beyond. That's laying your stuff down. That's basically saying, I'm not smart enough to know what these folks need and what's going on here. Even if I had an anthropology degree, and a sociology degree, and a psychology degree, I still wouldn't know enough. Because you're not from there. You're just not from there. You will hear strange things. I promise you that. So my proposal basically then is that the underlying nature of poverty, underneath the things that are missing, underneath the education and the ideas that are missing, underneath the access that is missing, is at the base, it's really about marred identity. People believe they're yet less than human and that they're God forsaken. And they don't know why they're here. In Genesis, in the very same sentence that says God made us in his image, it goes on to say, in order that we make his creation productive. We got a being and a doing identity. They're not bifurcated, they're not separated. Okay, And so the poor have that problem. Okay, let's look at this a little bit theologically. You guys all know this, so I'm going to do this really fast. Okay, first two chapters of the book. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creates the world and then decides to put us in it. Makes us in his image. And we are body, mind, and soul. That's the first lesson. We're not a part body, part mind, part soul. You can't separate them out. That's why you can't just save souls. You got to save body, mind, and souls. Okay. And hello. We're embedded in families and communities. Okay. And there are people that are different from us. We call them other. Could be a different tribe, different nation. Okay, different people group. And the reason that I put that up there is to remind you that the three-in-one God, the God who's inherently relational, can't be anything other than relational, made us relational beings. This, this 
strange Western idea of rugged individualism. You need to choose what is best for you and blah, 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 become everything you can. That's all bullshit. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just not true. That's not the way God made the world. And then, because God was clever enough not to be surprised by the fact that we have gone from a handful of people in a garden to seven billion people on a planet, we have to create some other stuff. We've got to create social systems, political systems, religious systems, and all that kind of thing. And this is what God intended. This is a relational picture of our reality. We are relational beings. It's all about how everything connects together relationally. And that's the way it was for two chapters. And then it stopped working in chapter 3 in Genesis. The traditional conservative evangelical view is that broke our relationship with God, and then we get totally preoccupied with getting people back in relationship with God. And so we should. That's a pretty important relationship. But we're not just a soul. Because sin also messed up our communities. Poverty, oppression, moral poverty, a web of lies characterize our communities instead of the relational stuff that was there before. And it messed us up in terms of others, the people we think are other. Because now we're afraid of them. Right? In a world of scarcity, which is the way the human planet was until the 19th century, the only way you got more was by doing what? I had to take it from somebody else. So we're afraid of the people we call other. They're a threat. And so violence, racism, my religion's better than your religion, you need to die, comes into place. My tribe is the tribe that's supposed to rule. America is the exceptional nation. The over, and it is, don't misunderstand me, but if exceptional means right to rule, then we part ways. Then we part ways. And this is the impact of sin, and then we mess up our relationship with God's creation to boot. And you all know about the environmental issues that we're facing. So by chapter 3 in the book, we're a mess. This is where I have an issue with Calvin, or at least the way people use Calvin. That would be more accurate. Utterly depraved, right? That's you and me. No. We're still a mixture of the original good that God intended and of the original sin that damaged us. And that's why every moment in life you find people that actually do something for somebody else instead of themselves. They become sacrificial. They actually love their neighbor. And then 10 minutes later, turn around and do something that grasps and pulls and takes advantage. Because we're all mixed up. We're just all mixed up. That's the way we are. And it is this combination of original good and original sin that we need to basically have in our minds as we think about the gospel encountering not just the poor, but you. It's for everybody. And then finally, one of the results of the fall is that none of us know who we really are. Not just the poor. None of us really know who we really are. None of us really understand what we're here for. Okay? Some people think that we're here for control. Exercising power, battling my demons, whatever it is. But this is what's going on. And so we have basically relationships, God's relational world that had enough and where everybody was going to be able to flourish became a world in which our relationships are not working for our well-being. So, oops, did I go too fast? No. So at the deepest level, I'm now moving from the cause of the nature of poverty, which is marred identity and forgotten vocation, to why is it marred and why is it forgotten? Because poverty is what happens to people whose relationships do not work for their well-being. Okay? And what is it that caused the relationships not to work for well-being. The cause is spiritual. 
Now, I am not spiritualizing poverty. But what I am saying is that when human sin entered, when sin entered the human condition, the world does not work for our well-being anymore. Our relationships don't work for our well-being. In, even inside our wonderful Christian churches, you know the stuff that goes on in there, right? It's also flawed because the sin is still there. Even though in a relationship with Jesus, we know that is not who we are. But until he comes again, blow the whistle and call the game, we struggle with this. So this is the way I think about the cause of poverty. So I'm, what I'm presenting to you this morning is the notion that poverty, that the poor are people whose identity has been marred. They're suffering from a poverty of being. The poor are people who have forgotten their true vocation of poverty of purpose. And the poor are people whose relationships work against their well-being Poverty of relationships. Poverty of being, poverty of purpose, po poverty of relationships. This is the bottom line. This is why the extra food, the education, doesn't fix the problem. Because it doesn't get at these things. It's needed. I am not saying don't feed people that are hungry. I am not saying don't clothe people who are naked. I am not saying don't visit the prisoner in prison. I'm just saying that's not the end of the gospel story. That's the beginning of the gospel story. Because that's what God is about. That's the project that he's on. He wants us to know who we are, his children. He wants us to know why we're here, to serve him and love our neighbors. And he wants us to create relationships that work for well-being. That is what the gospel's all about. And this is why it matters. I said this as I started. If you do not articulate your understanding of the cause of poverty or the nature of poverty, if you just leave it assumed, what happens is it shapes your response. So if you think the cause of poverty is that everybody's a sinner, what's your response? Hmm? What do you do? No. What do you do about sinners? What? You just bring them to Christ, tell them the gospel, right? All right, so you basically, it's evangelism. And kind of this assumption that if they come to know Jesus and he changes their life, things will improve. Which, by the way, there is a lot of empirical evidence for. All right? But if you think the poor are sinned against, if they're victims of injustice and oppression, then what do you do? Yeah. You'd work for social justice and change the system. If you think the poor lack knowledge, what do you do? Of course you do. You're smart people. If the poor lack things, what do you do? You give them things, okay? If the culture of the poor is the problem, what do you do? Huh? To what? Yeah. Okay, we developed, hey, just be like us, okay? But you see why this stuff is not just airy-fairy stuff to think about? It shapes how you respond. And I hope you're hearing me say that they are sinners. And they're sinned against. And they lack knowledge. And they lack... Okay? In other words, you got a whole package you got to work on here, folks. And this is still very individualistic. I haven't even got to the social, political, economic, and that kind of stuff. All right, I touched it a little bit in the second one. So then the strategic question is, what view of Christian transformation opposes, or opposes, addresses poverty, understood like this? And this is where I'm going to close. Because the good news is, is that as soon as we messed up at the end of chapter 2, and we got the results in chapter 3 of Genesis, God went to work. And he's been at work, ever since, on a project of redemption and restoration. God never gave up. God never gives up. Why? Because he loves you guys. This is about love. And so, the gospel says that it's the finished work of Jesus 
that allows us to begin to restore our relationship and know the God of the Bible, to be in Christ, to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that's the beginning of changing your understanding of who you really are. You are a child of God, loved by God, known by God. You have been given gifts to contribute. That's why you all are sitting in this room. You have figured out that you have something to offer the rest of the world and that you're responsible to make, it, make the offer. We have the potential, at least, in this new uh, restored relationship, this redemption, to now begin to see in our communities justice, sharing, righteousness. The web of truth begins to push out the web of lies. And now, when we look at something, and look at who we listen to, y'all, mostly white folk, listen to music in Arabic. That's an odd thing to do. Except you've made a discovery, which is that the many cultures on this planet was not an accident of God. He didn't kind of make a mistake. And it's not the result of the fall. It's actually part of God's gift. We are enriched when we are sharing across our cultural lines. We don't have to be afraid. we got to go give them a hug and say, what have you got for me? You see, it didn't matter that I didn't understand one damn word because I felt what was being sung. That hits you at some other place. And if I don't have that experience, I'm poorer. I'm poorer. And so now we begin to look at people from other places, other languages, and we embrace them. And now it's important that they too experience justice and peace. And that we're good stewards now, that we have the potential. Now the problem is, is that you and I are all living between that slide and the earlier one with all the broken relationships. Right? We got one foot in both worlds. This is where we're going. That much we know. At the end of the story, when you get to Revelation, that's the only thing left standing. But right now, we got one foot in this world and one foot in the kingdom. And you and I are constantly with a little battle inside and together between the original good and the original sin. But this is the thing that keeps us going. You know what? If you were only a sinner and that was the end of the story, you may as well not shoot yourself. Right? What's to work for? I've already achieved the goal. I'm a sinner. I'm done. This says, no, no, you're not, because that's not the truth. Pope John, or Pope Paul, um, I'm going to go, Pope, Pope John Paul II, when he was Bishop of Krakow, when it was still under the communist rule, he went to a different cathedral every Sunday. He had about five, six security guys, that not his security, the state security, that were watching him and listening to what he said to make sure he didn't say anything subversive in this church. And he would do this homily out of scripture, but it always closed the same way. You are not who they say you are. You are children of God. The state guys never understood how subversive that statement was. You are not who they say you are. That is the best news that we have alongside the news about Jesus. Your poverty doesn't have the, the last word. Okay, Your infirmity doesn't have the last word. Your disability doesn't have the last word. That's not who you are. Your work is not the last word. Your wealth is not the last word. The last word is God knows your name and loves you and wants to be in a relationship with you.